Hi, welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy and the book that I'm going to be reading from today is called Finding Junie Kim by Ellen O. And this is a new middle grade book. It is the story of Junie Kim, who is a third generation Korean American. And um, it's sort of her coming of age story, but it also has parts of it that are based on the author, Ellen O's, real life mother's experience living in Korea during the Korean War. So the book goes back and forth between Junie's experiences in current times and then her grandparents' experiences living in Korea right before and during the Korean War. So the book starts with Junie headed on her way to school on the bus, which is not something she loves to do, and you'll see why right in the first chapter. Um, she gets to school and she finds out that there has been racist graffiti that's been painted on the walls of the gym. And um, it turns out that it's been anti-Asian American, uh, anti-Black, and anti-Semitic graffiti that's been painted. And so that sort of sets off some desires in Junie's friends to sort of start doing something about that and become activists. And Junie isn't sure how she feels about participating in that. And then Junie kind of runs into her own struggles with some depression. And this book does a great job dealing with uh, Junie's depression and how she handles it and what that's like for her. Um, and then Junie spends, starts to spend more time with her grandparents, the ones who came from Korea. This coincides with the time when she has to do a school project where she is doing oral interviews of someone from that particular generation, the generation that her grandparents are from. And so she starts to talk to them about their experiences in Korea. So you get this really interesting back and forth between what Junie's going through with current day racism, which is very relevant to current events today, and then what her parents, what her grandparents went through during the Korean War and the time before the Korean War. And their chapters are really sort of these survivalist stories. They were left on their own to navigate some really pretty heavy and scary stuff. So I learned a lot from this book about um, the war in Korea and about the period right before the war that I didn't know that was very interesting to me. And I also thought that Junie was a great character the way she's portrayed. So I am going to read some of the first chapter of Finding Junie Kim. The chapters are a little longer in this book, so I won't read the whole first chapter. So the book, I'll read the dedication. This book is dedicated to my mom and dad and all the survivors of the Korean War. May it no longer be the forgotten war. Book one, Junie, chapter one. August is still the summertime. So why do we have to go back to school? Shouldn't school start in September when the summer is actually over? I don't get it. It's literally only a week away. Junie, hurry up or you'll, or you'll miss the bus. The first day of school and I'm already filled with that horrible, empty stomach, crampy feeling of dread. Junie! I can hear the slight annoyance in my mom's voice and yet I'm still frozen in place in my room, staring at my school bag. It's a brand new messenger bag, dark gray with bright red straps, just like I wanted. But it also means going back to the terrible place, middle school. Junie Kim. I'm coming. Grabbing my bag, I force myself to walk downstairs to the kitchen where my mom is waiting. On the table is a peanut butter and jelly waffle sandwich and a tall glass of milk. It's what I call my power breakfast and it's my favorite. But today the thought of eating makes my throat close up. You're gonna have to wolf that down fast, honey. I shake my head. I'm not hungry. Eat a little anyway, she says, pushing me into my seat. You need to eat breakfast to get through the day. She packs my lunch sack into my school bag and picks up a big stack of files. My mom is a lawyer with the Department of Justice. It sounds really cool, but it keeps her really busy. That's not as cool. Mom, can't you drive me to school today? I don't mind if I'm there early. She shakes her head regretfully. I'm sorry, honey, but I have a meeting and I have to run now. Otherwise, I'll be late. There will be no escaping hell this morning. 
It's the worst thing in the world that my best friends don't live near me and therefore I have no one to ride the bus with. It would make the trip bearable. At least last year, my older brother was on the bus with me, but now he's going to high school. I'll be all alone with the current worst person of Livingston Middle School. The walk to the bus stop is only a few blocks from my house, but it reminds me of a nightmare I always have. It starts with a scary chase sequence and ends with me falling off a building where the, fe where the fall feels like an intense forever as I scream and scream and then I finally jerk awake. The problem with the falling nightmare is that even after waking up, I'm still scared as if there's more to come. That's what it feels like reaching the bus stop. I don't know what else is coming, but I know it will be bad. Hey, it's the North Korean Kami. Taking the middle school bus every morning means listening to Tobias Rodney Thornton, the resident bully, spew racist hate at the only Asian student on the bus. That would be me, Junie Kim. I'm not the only non-white kid on the bus, but Tobias doesn't mess with the black or Latino boys, at least not on the bus, because there are more than one of them. Tobias is nothing but a bully and a coward, just like his older brother, Satan. Actually, his real name is Samuel Austin Thornton, but Satan suits him better. Nobody likes either of the Thornton brothers. They're both big and mean and don't care about what other people think of them. And Tobias is five foot 10 and probably like 200 pounds, so he could pummel anyone's opinions into the sidewalk. As long as I've had to deal with him, I've only ever seen him show two emotions, angry and more angry. This morning, he looks like he's his normal mean. Commie, he spits out as I scurry as far away from him as I can. The bus stop is on the corner of the local park. So there's a lot of space for us all to spread out. It's one of the biggest stops with anywhere from 15 to 20 kids waiting every day. Since Tobias has planted himself on the grassy corner of the park, I rush over to the end of the sidewalk and stand next to a no parking sign. I pray under my breath that he stays on the park side, but today is not my lucky day. Can't you hear me talking to you, dog eater? I hunch up like a sad turtle and try to ignore him, but he's now throwing sticks and dirt at me. I look around, hoping something else will grab his attention. Megan and her little clique huddle together as far away from me as possible. We haven't gotten along since I won first place for the sixth grade essay contest and she got second. She's never forgiven me for doing better in an English class when I was foreign and she was American. Truth is, even though I was born and raised here, I'll never be truly American to her. I'm friendlier with some of the boys, but right now everyone is just trying to avoid Tobias's attention. And since he's focused on me, they're all earnestly avoiding my eyes. Everyone's too afraid of him to stick up for me. I'm overwhelmed with this weird feeling that is sadness, but in a way I've never felt before. It feels like hopelessness. It feels like this is the rest of my life. The bus pulls up and I rush over to it. Since we're the first stop, it's completely empty. Even though it isn't cool to sit in the front, I make sure to sit near the bus driver. Tobias is mean, but not stupid. Our bus driver is not the friendliest man. He's no nonsense and does not like troublemakers. He keeps the rowdier kids in line by standing up and glaring. Since he looks like he wrestles alligators for fun, it's very effective. The bus has a hierarchy to it. All the sixth graders have to sit in the front of the bus while all the eighth graders lord it over everyone else in the back. Seventh graders sit in the middle or as close to the back as the eighth graders will allow. Since Tobias has claimed the back of the bus as his domain, I stay as far away from him as I can. In fact, I'd sit on top of the bus if I could to avoid breathing the same air as him. While there's only a few stops after hours, it always feels like the longest ride. Livingston Middle School is a big, boxy red building that looks like a prison. We pull into the parking lot and immediately notice that there are several police cars in front of the building. Usually there's at least one police car every morning, but four of them? Something must be up. Inside, everyone is speaking in hushed tones. The teachers don't say good morning. They all look so serious. 
The pale yellow hallways are crowded with students, which is unusual. Sixth graders head straight to the cafeteria and seventh and eighth graders are supposed to line up in the gym before first period, but it looks like no one is in the gym. In the crowd, I spot my best friends, Patrice and Amy. I weave over to them and see that Amy is crying and Patrice looks ready to hit something or someone. This is not surprising because they are usually opposites in almost all ways. Patrice is model beautiful and always wears her thick black hair slicked back and pulled tight into a low ponytail. Her dark brown skin is absolutely flawless. Meanwhile, Amy has bushy curly blonde hair that springs out everywhere and a ghostly white complexion that shows her multitude of freckles. What's wrong? Junie, someone sprayed swastikas and racist graffiti all over the gym walls, Patrice says angrily. My mouth drops open in shock. Did you see it? Patrice shakes her head. They won't let any of us in since the police are here, but everyone's talking about it. It was targeting blacks, Jews, and Asians. That's literally the three of us. Amy suddenly looks really scared. Do you think it was meant for us? Patrice bites her lip. It's not like we're the only ones. Does anyone know what it actually said? I ask. I think only the teachers know for sure, Patrice says, and they're taking it really seriously. I don't want to see it, Amy replies. Just hearing about it is awful. Who would hate us that much? We glance down the hallway where we see all the head administrators hovering around the gym doors. The morning bell rings and the hallway fills with moving bodies. It's loud, but not the normal boisterous of a middle school morning. And I'm going to stop there. So you get a little bit of a glimpse of what happens right at the beginning of the book that gets Judy and her friends, Patrice and Amy and the rest of the school so upset and sort of what creates a little bit of a, of a rift between Judy and her friends. Um, and you see some of Judy's personality and also the sort of heavy sadness that she feels um, in the beginning of the book. And you can see a little bit why what she deals with just riding the bus and uh, these microaggressions or at that she's facing every day. That's a lot for her to handle. So the chapters, as I said, go back and forth between Junie and her school and her grandparents and their time in Korea. And they are really interestingly paired and contrasted with one another. So if you like historical fiction, this is a great book to pick up, but it also is a great example of realistic fiction as well. I highly recommend Finding Junie Kim by Ellen O. Oh.